Um, so today, uh, you guys probably know Pastor Rob is on sabbatical. We have a guest speaker, Pastor Jerry Kellen, this morning. Uh, he has been in Eau Claire for 15 years. He's a pastor, was as a pastor, retired pastor from The Bridge uh, on Claremont. Uh, well, he was part of the church plant team there. He is happily married to his wife, Sue. He has three kids and eight grandkids, and he's going to be sharing uh, with us out of Habakkuk for the next three weeks. So if uh, you'd like to come on up, uh, Pastor Jerry, and teach. That would be wonderful. Thank you. And thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Ups, 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 ups. A good start. And I should uh, just say, I, <laughs> um, I have a better plan next week. <laughs> it's a trick. I kind of hobble around a little bit, and I'll just say that one of the reasons is, is because since COVID, um, I've had a total knee replacement then two back surgeries, and then a hip replacement. So I retired. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful to be here today. Um, Rob has been a good friend all the 15 years we've been here. Uh, I met Rob back in the beginning, and we grabbed lunch together. And uh, through the years, he's been very supportive. And one of the things we needed as a church plan is we needed a venue to launch our church plant, to go public and to tell the community we're here. And so he took me over to CVTC uh, and showed me the room where the edge, the college ministry at that time, was meeting. And I see somebody was there. And we liked it very much. And so we ended up renting it for two years. And Rob gave us that connection. And so through the years, we've had lunch many times. And in the last uh, couple of years, uh, my wife, Sue, has had the opportunity, and me, have had the opportunity to uh, grab a breakfast and to grab lunch with Rob and his Sue as well. So over the next three weeks, we're going to look at the small book, small book in the Old Testament, uh, Habakkuk. And I call Habakkuk the prophet for complainers. Um, he had some complaints with God, and I don't know about you, have you ever had a complaint with God? Have you ever been disappointed with God? Had some big questions for God? I think it's pretty normal for all of us to have questions for God. I'm look, I have a lot that I'm waiting to ask him one day. Donald Drusky was so disappointed with God that he took God to court. He had been fired from his job in U.S. Steel in 1968. And then he decided to take God to court. And the lawsuit read like this. The defendant, God, is the sovereign ruler of the universe and took no action against the leaders of his church and the leaders of his nation for their extremely serious wrongs, which ruined the life of Donald Drusky. For compensatory damages, Drusky, Drusky requested the return of his youth, the great skill of a guitarist, and the resurrections of his mother and pet pigeon. <laughs> the Syracuse court ruled in 1999 that his case was frivolous and therefore it was rejected. The problem seems to be that God doesn't always seem to do what people want. Maybe you've asked God for something that's really important to you and he didn't answer. He just, he seemed silent. Maybe you've asked God for someone in, that you love or someone that you know to be saved from the penalty of their sin. Maybe you've asked God to save a marriage or to bring healing to a physical problem and there was no answer. And the question comes, why? Why doesn't he answer? Why is he silent? 
This was Habakkuk's experience in the 7th century before Christ. We don't know much about Habakkuk. What we know is right here in this book. Um, But you may know that Habakkuk contains one of the most important verses in all the Bible. You can just start looking now and see if you can find it. Um, So we want to start right now with, uh, in verses 1 through 4, and we're going to look at the prophet's disappointment with God. Um, Habakkuk receives a prophecy from God. It's it's an oracle from God. Um, It's a burden from God. And, And those are all translations used for this prophecy. And the idea is, as a burden, this is a heavy message. It's a heavy prophecy. And it weighs uh, Habakkuk down. And so he has this question for God. He's, very di- he's received this prophecy, and he's so disappointed with it. Now, you may know that the prophet's role in the Old Testament was primarily to take the message of God and then declare it to God's people. But Habakkuk doesn't do that. He takes this message, and then he goes right back to God with his questions. And so this personal experience of Habakkuk is recorded right here for us. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The prophecy of, uh, that Habakkuk the prophet received, verse 2, here it is. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Um, I cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Now, it's helpful, I think, to understand a bit of the historical background that's happening here. Uh, you know, like what happened in the 7th century before Christ? I don't know. It's, that's a long time ago. Um, there's a lot of important things that happened. And um, the time right here is between 609 B.C. and 605 B.C., Now, Josiah was a great king of Judah. There were a lot of reforms under King Josiah, but he was killed in 609 B.C. at the Battle of Carchemish. And the kings that followed were kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord. And three of those were his descendants right off the bat. And so in 605 B.C., a great tragedy happened. Jerusalem was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Daniel's day. Um, And so Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he destroys the city. So this prophecy is right there in between those two time periods. We know that the destruction of the city hasn't happened yet. The kings that followed King Josiah promoted foreign gods and they worshipped idols and the rich got richer and the poor got poor and uh, the leaders were cruel and violent. Politicians and court officials were corrupt. Immorality was rampant. God was dishonored. And Habakkuk, one of the godly remnant, uh, Habakkuk was a godly man. He knew God. And it just made him ill to see what was happening to God's people right before his very eyes. And so he prayed often for God to intervene, but God was silent. And so we see the question, the next question is, God, why don't you care about injustice? And that's going to be developed in three and four. Why do you make me look at injustice? Verse three, Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? God, why don't you care? I don't understand. It's not right. God, you need to do something. You ever felt that way? Destruction and violence are before me, Habakkuk says. There is strife and conflict abounds. God's people are turning on themselves. And the words here uh, for strife and conflict uh, speak of legal situation, legal situation. Uh, court decisions. And the court was corrupt. Uh, corrupt. It, it was overrun with bogus lawsuits, self-centered for selfish gain. Verse 4, this is what 
Habakkuk concludes. He says, therefore the law is paralyzed. That's just a lot. That seems like a logical conclusion. The law has no power. It doesn't seem like the law has authority. It's not impacting people. People don't respect it. You know, it's not like, it doesn't seem like it's living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It seems to be inactive. It seem, seems to be destabilized. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. And justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous, and, the, and justice is perverted. Justice is a sham. And for Habakkuk, this is just wrong. God, why don't you do something? God, we need justice. God, we need somebody to clean this place up. Now, Habakkuk is honest. And God is okay with honest questions. It's okay to complain to God. But there's a way to go about it. And it's about treating God with respect and honor as you state the issues that you have. It's normal for us to have things that we're disappointed with and that we need to take to God. And that's where the, the, the correct place to go. The psalmist complained to God many times. Job complained to God. Jeremiah complained to God. And even Jesus complained to God. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, did Jesus have a theology problem? I don't think so. He was just being honest. That's how he felt. That was the situation he was in. Verses 5 through 11, there's going to be an answer. And we see God's declaration of his intentions in verses 5 through 11. And the answer comes. God will do something utterly amazing. Verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. Habakkuk, I have a big surprise for you. You didn't see this one coming. It's not what you expected at all. But I am answering. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Now, that's such a, this is one of those important verses. This is not the most important verse in my view in the book of Habakkuk, but that's going to be quoted in Acts chapter 13 when the gospel is presented, that there's something so amazing that if you were told you would not believe that Christ would die for the penalty, the sin penalty of the world, and there would be an offer that anyone who believes could be forgiven and saved and have eternal life. I'm going to do something in your days and you wouldn't believe it if you were told. Watch for it. Look at the nations. Habakkuk, you're focused on your little world. It's a small world. Yes, it's important and it is your world and it is valid. I'm doing something bigger than that. Look at the nations. And the nations refer to those countries that are not Israel, that are not Jewish. They are Gentiles, and they're called the nations. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something worldwide. I have, a, I have a real big scheme of things, and you need to wait for it and watch for it. And so in verses 6 through 11, we see more of the answer from God. And God will discipline his own people. This is, now this is an answer to prayer because didn't Habakkuk think they needed some kind of correction? Verse 6. God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. So Habakkuk, here's my answer. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. And they're just going to come, and they're going to sweep across. Now, he says the whole earth, and basically he's talking about the known world, something Habakkuk could understand, the known world. 
Now, Habakkuk was concerned about justice, and here's the plan. It's the Babylonians. They have become the new world power as of 609 B.C. After they defeated the Assyrians, if you know Old Testament history and Isaiah, the Assyrians took Israel captive, and they invaded Israel in, in the 8th century before Christ. And now the, the new nation comes, the new world power, and they finally defeat Assyria and the Egyptians in 609 B.C. And so God has been raising them up all along. God has been working in ways that we don't understand. By the way, he's doing that right now. He's working in our world in ways that we do not understand. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's easy for me when I think about theology is something I love. And I understand that God is infinite and he has an infinite mind. And if he were to download just a small portion of, of his knowledge onto me, I would be vaporized. And he, he is doing stuff that's way over my head. Someday, I have a lot of answers. There's another passage that brings me great comfort. is uh, Deuteronomy 29.29 which says the secret things belong to the Lord our God and the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. This is what's been revealed. They've been revealed to us and our children forever. It's our job to know this book. And there's so much we can learn about who God is and how he operates and what he's done in the past and what he said he's going to do in the future. There's so much information there. You know, sometimes I, I hear Christians get stuck on a problem and, and they, don't, they don't understand this about God and they have such a small viewpoint. There's so much more that's been revealed in this book. And it's, it, it's just something we need to invest our lives in to, to get the whole picture of who God is and what he is like. But the secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are things that God hasn't told us. They're secret things. They belong to him. Maybe he's going to be able to share more of it in eternity. But I can't know everything. I don't have an answer for everything. I like to try, but I'm very limited. So God's raising up the Babylonians. By the way, I think we have a map. Yes, I'm a big proponent of maps. I think God's people should learn about geography. So... Um, on the, the water is the Mediterranean Sea. Up uh, in the north is that city, Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital or the, the stronghold of the Assyrian Empire. And by the way, Jonah was sent there to preach. And they ruled the world at the time. And it was a very evil place. Now Babylon is, is the new kid on the block. And that's, Babylon is a city that's the center of the Babylonian Empire. And today, that's modern-day Iraq. And so Jerusalem, I hope we know, that's where the temple of God is, and that's where Habakkuk is. And God is raising up the Babylonians, and he's going to bring them down to Jerusalem. Um, so he says, I'm raising up the Babylonians. Verse 7, they are feared. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote uh, their own honor. The Babylonians are feared, rightfully so, and they're dreaded, rightfully so. They will be an instrument of God's judgment. That's going to be a hard one for Habakkuk. Doesn't make sense to him. They are a cruel people. They learned cruelty from their predecessors, uh, the Assyrians. They are a law unto themselves. That means, that in their mind, there is no higher authority. They are it. There is no God higher than their authority. They have no value for God's law. God continues describing Babylon as his instrument of judgment in verse 8. 
He says, their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. Um, Their method of warfare here is a precursor to the Blitzkrieg. Some of you know what that is. 1939, 1940, Nazis invade Europe. They did it with lightning speed. Persian Gulf War, shock and awe. That's what the Babylonians did in the 7th century before Christ in their world. Um, and and they, they are the early uh, ad, ad, adopters of military on horseback, cavalry, 7th century before Christ. And they had large numbers of cavalry. And they overwhelmed their enemies with speed and lightning. Verse 9, they will come intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind. They gather prisoners like sand. They don't come for peace. They, they glory and celebrate in violence. Um. That's how you prove yourself. That's what makes men, is violence. They take prisoners like sand. So many prisoners, you can't count them. They are major players in human trafficking. These are sold into slavery, and they become wealthy in their slave trade. Um, Verse 10, they mock kings and scoff at rulers. So the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, and uh, this is how they treated the king of Jerusalem. This is one of the descendants of Josiah in uh, 2 Kings chapter 25. So just follow along. Um, they, They mock kings and they scoff at rulers. Um, this was a way that they humiliated kings. And they, when they came into a city or a nation and they captured a king, they sometimes would put them in a cage and then just parade them through the territory uh, in the cities and in the countryside. This is what they did in Jerusalem. So in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, so he's the king of Judah. He's a, he's a descendant of um, Josiah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. He encamped outside the city, and he built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. Quick comment here. It's mentioned here in Habakkuk, building siege walls. How do you do that? Well, some of you know right off the bat. But the way they did that is, so there might be a a wall in Jerusalem that's 40 feet high. How are you going to overcome that? Well, they just got an ox cart or a donkey cart and they filled it with dirt and they hauled it up to the wall and they dumped it. A lot of ox carts. The bigger they are, the better. Somebody has to load those carts and somebody has to empty them. And they spent two years building the siege works so that they could go up the 40-foot wall. And then they went into the city and captured the city. That's how they invaded cities. It's a lot of time and a a lot of energy. In verse 11, they sweep past like the wind and and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. They just keep going. They just sweep through like the desert wind. They are a guilty people. Uh, Their supreme value and asset is their military prowess, their own strength. Their own strength is their God. I think we have trouble with that sometimes, where we place ourselves in the center of our universe and we call the shots. And that's the way we want it. They have no regard for the true and living God. No regard for the sovereign ruler of the universe. So here's a question for us. Why would God do this? Why would God discipline his people like this? Well, I don't know all the answers, but I can tell you a big clue here. 
800 years before the book of Habakkuk, God gave the law of Israel to Moses. 613 commands, if you probably know that. The law is all of it together, all 613 commands. And the law set aside how to relate to God, how to show love for God, how to honor God. It showed how to relate to your neighbor, how to treat your neighbor with respect, how to love your neighbor. That's what the law did. It set forth instructions and rules on how to live. Now, one of the things that God said in the law is Deuteronomy chapter 28 through 32. I'm going to look at a couple of verses here. First, Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2. Do we have that? Okay, good. God said to his people, if you obey your, your God, the Lord your God, and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. You know what? He did that in David and Solomon's day. Godly leaders were leading the nation, and there was a sense, not perfection, a sense of godliness through leadership. And, and, and God will set you on high above all the nations. And all these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. So the next part of 28 tells us what some of those things were. Um, the blessings in Deuteronomy 28, that, that God's people would be blessed in the city and in the country. That God's people, that God's, the children of God's people would be blessed and that their animals would be blessed. They would thrive. The crops would be plentiful, and they would prosper. They would defeat their enemies that may rise up against them, and they would have peace. They would have shalom. All you have to do is follow the Lord. And that was a, that was a promise that God made to Israel, and it had a condition. Now, there's a lot of unconditional promises in the Bible, which I'm very grateful. God is going to carry them out. It doesn't depend on us. But, but these are conditional promises here. In the land of Israel, for the land of Israel, for God's people of the Old Testament. And they would be blessed for their obedience. But then we go down to verse 15. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees that I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. So this is the other side. What are the curses of 28? Well, they would be cursed in the city. They would be cursed in the country. Their harvests would fail. Their families would suffer. Their animals would suffer. There would be plagues and diseases. Their weather patterns would destroy their crops. Food would be scarce. And then we drop all the way down to Deuteronomy 28, verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven, and you will become a thing of whore by all the kingdom, uh, to all the kingdoms on earth. God is going to allow your enemies, Israel, to overtake you, to invade you, and destroy your cities and towns. Now, I would encourage you to write down Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 52, because there's details about what happened when Babylon invaded Israel. God said it was going to happen 800 years earlier with these conditions. Now, you may know that the history of the Old Testament can be summed up with Deuteronomy 28 right here. When God's people walked with God, life was good and there was peace in Israel. And when God's people began to dishonor God and follow after other gods, they ran into big trouble. And usually they were invaded. And two times... The invaders came in and carried off thousands and thousands of people 
the Assyrian captivity and the Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah prophesied about that, uh, the Babylonian captivity in detail. The standard that God used was always the same, the law. If you obey, I will bless. If you, cur- if you do not obey, you will experience some really hard stuff. God raised up prophets. The purpose of the prophets are to speak to God's people, and it's usually to speak to their current day situation, to point them back in the right direction. When they, when they got out of bounds, God raised up prophets to speak to them. And the prophets uh, told them where they needed to repent, and the prophets also revealed inform- important information about the future, things about Jesus coming, things about future things to us today in, 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 the, in the last days in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, so uh, now we're going to come to that last section and uh, verses 12 through 17, the prophet's dilemma with God. We've, we've had disappointment with God. We've had a declaration from God and now we're having the dilemma with God. Um, so Habakkuk complained. God spoke. Now the dilemma. It's about what the prophet wants and what God wants. That's a dilemma. The dilemma is what do you want for your life and what does God want for your life? They don't always align easily, do they? So we come, Habakkuk comes with more questions. God, why do you use evil people? And we're going to see this in verses 12 and 13. I don't understand, God, why you would do this. It doesn't make sense to me. Not how I would do it. Verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? The answer is yes. See, Habakkuk has good theology. He knows the true and living God. God is eternal. And Habakkuk knows God. He has a personal relationship with him. He, he continues, my God, the Holy One. It's, it's Habakkuk's God. It's personal. And yes, God is the Holy One. He is holy. That's true. You will never die. Yes, he's eternal. And now he understands, and, and he's, Habakkuk is agreeing with God about theology here. He's saying, God, you are sovereign. I believe that. You said you're going to do this. You're going to do it. I don't understand. He goes on. Look at this. He says, um, you, Lord, have anointed them to execute judgment. Habakkuk understands. He's been told, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. Habakkuk doesn't argue that. That's what God's going to do. He's sovereign. And then, and then Habakkuk says, my rock... Uh, God is stable. God is strong. God is steadfast. That's that's Habakkuk's God. Um, He's secure. He's he's stable. But God is going to use those Babylonians, those awful people, to be his instrument of judgment. So Habakkuk continues, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And so Habakkuk knows God, and he just doesn't understand. Why do you tolerate the treacherous, treacherous? Good question. Except God warned them in Deuteronomy 28 that this could happen. This was not new. He didn't understand. God had already made those, they just didn't want to believe it was true. That you would actually do this, God. It's not the way I pictured it. Why are you silent when when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Now, so here's the deal. The, The problem is the Babylonians are a guilty people. Even God said they were guilty. The other problem is The Jewish people are guilty people as well. The people of Israel are guilty people as well. And, um, you know, 
You've, you've probably heard this before, that what if God were to eliminate evil at 12 noon today? All evil in the universe would be eliminated. Well, you know the answer. We, we would all be removed. We would be taken out. And so uh, Habakkuk's playing the comparison card here. So God, they're really, really bad. We're not quite that bad. Why would you use them? And God is just doing what he said he would do. He's judging his people just the way he said he would do it. Oh. Verses uh, 14 and 15, Habakkuk just continues. He says, why do you endorse injustice? It's not fair, God. Verse 14, you have made people like fish in the sea, like sea creatures that have no ruler. Um, so Habakkuk thinks about his predicament, and he just sees, we're like fish, God. We have, we're not valuable here. We're not players. Um, people can just come and take us when they want to. We don't have a leader. God, you're not leading us right now. We, we are viewed as unimportant, as if God has forgotten. Like fish, they'll be easily caught. And then verse 15 the Babylonians are pictured here like commercial fishermen. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. And uh, he's, they're using fishing terminology here, but sometimes they actually literally used hooks in the ancient... To, to, when they took prisoners, they sometimes put hooks in their nose or in their lip. And they actually shackled them that way and pulled them along. Um... The wicked foe, foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Um, next question. Why do you put up with idolaters? Verses 16 and 17. And this is the last question. Therefore, he, that is the armed invader, sacrifices to his net and he burns inset to his incense to his dragnet for by his net he lives in luxury he enjoys the choice choices of food they're taking in prisoners they're trafficking these prisoners and they're making tons of money and they're living in luxury by what they do verse 17 is he to keep on emptying his net destroying nations without mercy is this going to go on and on god uh, are they just going to keep filling their nets with slaves forever? How long must this go on? Doesn't make sense. So I want to invite you to tune in next week because there's more to the story that we have to hear to put it all together. Question for us. Why does God put up with evil today? There are a lot of answers. I don't have all the answers. And I go back to the secret things belong to the Lord our God and the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. But we do have some clues, at least give some answers to some things. Uh, first of all, I just want to remind us, God has already done something about evil in the universe. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, because He loved us so much. And that Jesus would come to this earth, earth and show us the way to the Father. And that Jesus would lay down his life as a sacrifice, as a payment for the penalty of sin. And when Jesus died, God the Father was satisfied. Justice was accomplished in God the Father's eyes. And the sin penalty was paid for. And a victory over eternal death was won. And there was a victory over Satan himself. Satan has been defeated. But the final sentence hasn't been carried out yet, has it? And it's going to be at the lake of fire after Jesus returns. And so there's still a lot of stuff in this world that makes life really, really hard. And a lot of it is evil. But God has done something. And that, that makes a huge difference for us who have hope, who have resources to live day by day in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and we have the Word of God to guide us. It makes a huge difference. Secondly, this was a lot harder. Sometimes he disciplines his own people. Sometimes he disciplines his own people harshly. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there were the church, believers in Corinth, abused the Lord's table. And the scripture says, the apostle Paul says, some of those believers went to be with the Lord early. They died because of their disobedience. Some of them became sick, so there was illness related to the discipline on the church in Corinth. And there was 1 Corinthians 5 too, the, the man caught in immorality, and he was disciplined by the church. And, and the Apostle Paul said, uh, turn this man over to Satan. Those are harsh words. They're strong words. So that his soul will be saved, but his body can be destroyed. His flesh will be destroyed. So kick him out of the church and let, hi, let the world influence his life. And if Satan wants to take him, it's okay. His soul is going to be saved. He never deserved to be saved anyway, just like you and me. It's by grace. It's not by, did I do good enough? But that's harsh discipline. That's what we have for the church. Um, sometimes uh, we get disciplined through circumstances. Sometimes, and Anytime things are really, really hard, it's just good to say, God, is there something you want me to learn here? Is there something I need to do? And sometimes it's just, this is just life, and um, I need to cope with it. I need to walk with God through this and trust God is going to get me through. Sometimes it might be the authorities, Revel uh, Romans chapter 13. We step out of line, we might get caught speeding and uh, we might be arrested for some law that got violated and the authorities get our attention and God can use that. One of the passages that uh, speak of discipline is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses five through seven. I'm sure you probably know this one. God always has a purpose when he disciplines. Um, verse, verse five. And have you, and here's what the writer says, and have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. It's just going to be normal if you're a follower of Christ. God's going to bring discipline. You know what? The best way to describe discipline is it's training it's child training. It's the same as Proverbs 22, 6. Train up your child in the way they should go. Train. That's what discipline is. God is training his kids. Verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. How do you learn order? How do you learn stability? How do you learn to say no? How do you learn to say yes? Somebody has to help. And that's why God gave us parents. Um, when I played uh, high school football, somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, um, I had football coaches that were pretty tough. I know that they never sought to hurt me or to harm me in any way. But they made me do a lot of things. They made me run wind sprints. They made me run agility drills. They made me run wind sprints again. They made me run uh, plays from the line of scrimmage. They had people tackle me over and over and over. They, they had people hit me as hard as they could over and over. And then we had to run more wind sprints. Our oxygen was totally depleted. I don't think my coaches were trying to hurt me. They were training me to be a football player. And they, in fact, transformed me into a football player. 
God likes to do that with us. He likes to transform us to become more like Jesus. Verse 11, no discipline seems to be pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. There are rewards for allowing God to train your life. And God uses difficult circumstances in our life, hard things, and he wants to mold the character of Jesus into us. Some things are much harder than others, and I don't, this is where, you know, I know it's just as easy to say, how can you say that? Um, there, there are, you know, people lose loved ones, people lose kids, people experience divorce, and they don't want it. Uh, people lose a career, they didn't plan on that. There are just big things that happen. And I don't have any simple answer. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that just because hard things or bad things happen to us that we're being disciplined. I don't think that at all. Sometimes it's just because we live in a fallen world. Yet we know God has a purpose when he works in our lives. That he can take those really, really hard things and he can work good for us and continue to transform us and to shape us to be more like Jesus. Lastly today, I just want to um, talk about why we're still here. And we see that in number three, he's being patient with people who don't know him yet. I'm so glad God was patient with me, because I was a pretty rough, a pretty rough uh, person uh, and my wife had to live with me seven years before I came to faith. And um, I'm so grateful God was patient with me because he could have pulled me out anytime he wanted to. And he was just patient and he kept to show me grace. I didn't deserve it, never will deserve it. And he was so kind and gracious to me. And um, you know that from uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Um, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God has promised to bring a final judgment on all evil, and this is going to happen when Jesus returns. But God allows evil in the universe right now. Things that are hard and difficult, things that may cause us real pain. God allows that partially because he's waiting patiently and he's, got, he's working, he's got a plan, he's got purpose, he's a sovereign God, he's working things out for good for those who love him, and he's working to convict people of sin and righteousness and judgment, and he's drawing people to Jesus right now. And Cedar Creek, that's why you're here. That's what God intends for the church, is to take that message and to, to, to live in a way that shines brightly for Jesus Christ and reflects his character as ambassadors for Christ so that we have platforms to tell other people about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. That he died on the cross that he paid the penalty for all sin. And now we can invite you to place your faith in Christ if that's a choice you want to make. Many of you know the story of uh, Corey Ten Boom. And um, maybe you've read her book, The Hiding Place, or maybe you saw the movie, The Hiding Place. Corey and her family were born again Christ followers. They were, they were Dutch, um, living in Amsterdam. Um, the Nazis began to invade the Netherlands in 1940. And then they began to carry out the plan to take 100,000 Jewish prisoners and put them into concentration camps. Corey's family began to hide uh, Jewish families to protect them from the Nazis. It was very risky and it was very dangerous. And after two years, the Ten Boon family was arrested and placed in concentration camps. 
Corey's father died within 10 days. Whether it was uh, purpose or some other reason. Um, Corey and her sister Betsy was, were placed in the Ravensbrook camp. And it was extremely overcrowded, people on top of each other. And it was infested with fleas. And some of you know the story. And uh, it was so bad that the guards refused to enter the barracks. Um, there was a Bible smuggled into the camp, and the women began to have Bible studies at night. And one of the things that they read was, in all things, give thanks. This is God's will for you, in all things. And so Betsy reasoned, we should give thanks for the fleas. And Corey protested, that is ridiculous. And uh, so Betsy give, gave God thanks for the fleas. But something happened in the camp. The guards would not go into the barracks because of the fleas. And God used the fleas to protect those women. Um, God wanted Habakkuk to trust him. That's what, um, that's what Betsy did. She trusted God. In all things, give thanks. Okay, I'm going to thank God. God said it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust him in this. And God protected and took care of them. God wanted Habakkuk to trust him. He didn't understand. This horrible situation. God, Habakkuk, I want you to trust me. You know what that, the most famous verse is? It's in Habakkuk 2.4. We're going to look at that next week. And the last part of the verse says, and the righteous will live by faith. That's what Betsy did. That's what God wants Habakkuk to do. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to live by faith, even when we don't understand. Um, when you think about difficult circumstances, your difficult circumstances, what are you thankful for? Have you thought about that recently? What are you thankful for? I just want to encourage you to maybe take some time and make a list of the things that are difficult in your life, things that are hard, struggles. It could be health issues, relational issues, financial issues. What's hard? And what are you thankful for? And what can you trust God for? Next week in chapter 2, God is going to answer Habakkuk, and he's not going to like it. So I want you to come back. Would you please stand with me? And I'd like to pray. Father, I'm grateful to be here today, grateful for Cedar Creek Church and for how you've raised them up and the testimony they are in our community. And may they just continue to shine brightly and to represent you and to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. God, help us to learn from um, Habakkuk. Help, help us to continue to learn from the whole counsel of God to see who you are and what you've done. Lord, we confess that we don't always understand. We know who you are. Help us to grow in our understanding. Help us to grow our faith. Thank you that we can trust that you are working good and that you desire to form us and to transform us to be more like Jesus. God, um, I know there are people here that have really hard stuff, and I can't uh, say that I, uh, that I understand or that there's a simple answer, but God, encourage them, and um, may they just continue to tr trust you as you um, guide their steps and, and lead them. May you be their resource and their strength. And so, Father, we just uh, commit these things to you, and we thank you for the privilege to worship today in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.